Our last presentation today is by Mr. Dick Hanna from uh, Houston Area to Safety Council. He's the VP of Learning and Innovations, and his, uh, his presentation today is going to be on innovations in the industry. Thank you very much. So I appreciate... <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate all of you being here. It's a very intimate group, which I enjoy, so I'm sure there'll be some great questions. Um, so as you heard, my presentation's on innovations in industry. Uh, and I came about getting this through a book I was reading called Race of Aces. And Race of Aces is about uh, World War II aces. And they talk about an innovation um, for these World War II aces was the P-38. And my grandfather actually flew P-38s, and so it has a specific connection with me. And this guy's name is Dick Bong, uh, which is a great name. And uh, he killed or shot down 38 different zeros. And he was one of the aces. And there was a battle between all of these P-38 fighters to see who could turn the tide of the war. And the point of the, of the book is that they feel this innovation turned the tide of the war, right? The zero had dominated the sky until the P-38 came along and it was able to outperform the zero, fly higher, fly faster. The problem is, who's ever heard of hardcore history? Dan Carlin's hardcore, if you listen to podcasts, this is a long form podcast that's outstanding. And he has a five part series that's about 21 hours, all about World War II. The problem here is, he believes the innovation that turned the tide of World War II was not the P-38, but instead was the aircraft carrier. Uh, before that, they had battleships that would take seven years to build. A aircraft carrier could be built in maybe one or two years, and you could build uh, airplanes in no amount of time for very minimal cost. And you throw a bunch of airplanes at a battleship, you sink seven years of production, and it turned the tide of the war. Uh, so the point of this is there is no one innovation that we look for to turn anything. It's a series of different things that will turn that tide. Right now I'm reading a book called Diffusion of Innovation. And this is about what innovations take off and what don't and why. And I was just talking to you about this, about why some technology takes off and some technology does not. And what they bring up are two different things I wanted to share with you all. The first one is scurvy. Scurvy is a malady that uh, hits sailors, particularly in the, this was in the 15th century and the 16th century. And diffusion of innovation brings up the fact that a captain uh, back in the 1600s had, was, I guess he was a commodore, he had four ships and he was, he was going a very long distance. He had one ship eat lemons and the others didn't. And the one ship that had the lemons, they didn't have any cases of scurvy. This was in 1601, and they figured out that citrus helped cure scurvy. It wasn't until about 200 years later they actually did anything about it. And so that diffusion of innovation took almost 200 years. And during that time, people were still suffering from scurvy. And so it talks about what takes off and what doesn't and why it takes so long. And just to belabor the point for you guys, I have one more that's, I think, very interesting. This is called a QWERTY keyboard, right? Because you have Q-W-E-R-T-Y at the top left, QWERTY. That's what everyone uses. The problem is it was built for this. They built the keys in this pattern so they wouldn't jam up when you typed. That was the pur purpose behind it. There's actually a keyboard called the Dvorak keyboard, which is better. It's quicker. People can type and learn on it faster. And it makes more sense based on the words. It, it uses your hands better, your fingers better. We do, it was built or brought out in the 1930s. And people who learn the Dvorak keyboard can outperform QWERTY keyboard users by leaps and bounds. And yet, I bet no one here knew about that keyboard. It's even, you can change your computer right now to the Dvorak. And you can go buy one. No one uses it. And it's been around since the 1930s or earlier. And so what I like to talk about with that is the fact that innovation doesn't just happen and doesn't just get out into the marketplace because we want it to or because it's good. There's other factors in mind and in line here that we have to address. So the innovations that are out there for us right now are massive online communities, open communities, micro-learning, spaced practice. We have podcasts. We have virtual live networking but I'm gonna talk about virtual reality. And virtual reality is one of these things where we're going through a diffusion of innovation right now. 
this is actually what we have at HASC right now. We have two different courses that we're studying. What we've done is we have built our courses on top of our traditional computer-based training. You can see here that you're seeing Firewatch training on the right. A lot of people will ask, well, is this as good as hands-on training? It's, it's not, you can't really compare it. And the reason I say that is, at one point during our Firewatch virtual reality training, we set five barrels on fire to such a degree, your response is supposed to be, go run away. <laughs> you can't do that in hands-on. I've never seen anyone do that in a fire, <laughs> Firewatch hands-on. And so the, the purpose of virtual reality is not to be better than hands-on. It's supposed to allow you to pr practice different things than you could in hands-on. It's almost a bridge between computer-based training, which has no hands-on, to the hands-on training that so few people get. The way we built these, and I'm glad you're here, Peter, because we were discussing this right before. Right now, HASC has a model for delivery that has computer-based training with a test at the end, right? People come in, they do this. We have 1,000 people a day. This is primarily what they do. We can't upset the apple cart by throwing virtual reality in on top of that. Virtual reality typically requires more real estate. You have to move around. A lot of our learners are not technically proficient, and so they don't like that idea. They don't know how to use the joysticks. They don't, they're almost a little scared of it. Um, but what we did was we built small exercises into the computer-based training. So instead of having a 30-minute long computer-based training, we have two five-minute exercises that allow them to try out the processes and theories that they're seeing in the computer-based training. This also allows the, the learner just to remain seated. There's no need to get up and move around. Just take off your headset, put on another headset, and try it out. Uh, a lot easier for the learner and a lot more efficient in terms of space. We have 800-something computers. We can't break that model, so we worked within that model. And so we did a study, and we took 700 users who took Firewatch training, and we compared the, the learners who took Firewatch without VR to the learners who took Firewatch with VR to determine if there was any benefit to the virtual reality. Uh, this is called, this is from an ANOVA table where we're looking at whether or not there is a significant change based on that study. And you can see that we had 1,200 people take non-VR CBT. We had 440 virtual reality take, uh, learners. And we see that the, the average score for the non-VR, the typical CBT, was 94. And for the VR, about 94. And so at this point, I became very worried about my job because I'd spent thousands of dollars to change things and make them better, and it was the exact same score. Um, and it was also statistically insignificant, right? It didn't change enough to make it statistically significant. The good news was, that I read a study that said most of the virtual reality uh, learning comes in long-term memory development. Long-term memory development is not shown here. This was taken directly after the course was completed, which is a short-term memory or working memory. And so what we did was we attached a chatbot quiz at the end. And if everybody who came in, let's say Peter came in and he took the CBT and then the test, we said, what's your phone number? We'd like to contact you afterward and give you a quiz. And we did the same thing with the virtual reality users. We said, what's your phone number? Let's make sure we contact you afterward. Now, we didn't get as many people responding to the quiz. I was surprised that more people weren't excited to take a quiz on their own time. <laughs> but what we did see of those who responded, and you can see we had 150 non-VR versus 50 VR respond, which isn't a bad selection. We'd like to see more, uh, but we saw went from 70% a week later, this is what they remembered for their test, to 70, almost 78%, which, which is statistically significant. And so what this told us was there was a place for virtual reality. And truthfully, what we're looking to do with a lot of our training is something called uh, transfer of knowledge. Transfer of knowledge means taking what you learn in a safety council, for instance, and actually utilizing it in the field. This is what that's showing, right? So you have better transfer of knowledge with virtual reality than you do without the virtual reality. 
Now, there's still th some things to work out with this. Uh, right now, what we're working with is confined space. Uh, confined space training is difficult to understand for new hires. And this allows them to practice potentially very dangerous confined space operations in the safety of a virtual world. In this one that you're seeing here, a cave-in happens on this wall right here and smothers that fellow right there. And the whole watch, who's under virtual reality, has to act. Well, how often do you get to try that in a hands-on? Very rarely. Uh, then, after that, we show them where this has actually occurred in their industry. And what we're trying to do there is provide relevance. So that if Peter comes in and takes it, and he's like, yeah, this is great, but it's never really going to happen to me. Nope, Peter, it really does happen. It could happen a lot. And now you're more prepared for it. Uh, we're also taking snippets of interviews with family members who are involved in this and giving them a quick um, emotionally resonant video. And the purpose behind that is, in general, you're going to remember things that are emotional more than those that are not. Hopefully, Ron, you remember the birth of your children or your wedding day more than what you had for lunch last week. And that's what we're trying to inspire here is the emotional resonant moment where they remember this training. The next step is to do that same study and determine if we can get higher than a 10% that we got on that Firewatch one. I believe we can get up to 25% with this. Uh, right now, we've done a qualitative study on that. Qualitative meaning I ask Peter, hey, Peter, what'd you think of this? Do you think it would help you? Uh, we have not done the quantitative one yet where we compare numbers, but the qualitative study shows that even the Peters of the world love it. They think it's really worthwhile. They come away, this is interesting for you too, Ron, they come away with a greater sense of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a challenge for new hires in today's day and age, particularly with stop work authority. One of the things I always had trouble with at Hydrogen PSC or any other organization I worked with was telling a new hire, hey, if you see something wrong, even if it's your boss doing it, stand up and tell him he's wrong and stop the work. That's very hard for a new hire to do. But by going through a virtual reality training, we improve their self-efficacy and their, their confidence. Hopefully, they'll, they'll be able to overcome that challenge a little quicker. Dick, you, um, when you start to get some of this data, are you going to try to break it out into uh, the social economic information to be able to do your analysis, looking at people's ages, um, so, you know, you, so you can be able to start to see what is, what is your sweet spot for the market? So if you're in this age group from, you know, 18 to, to 35, you're a prime candidate. But if you're, if you're 55 and older, don't even go there. You know, why waste the resources and create additional stresses on that particular worker when you find out that only maybe one in, one in 20 of that age group would embrace such a, a learning technique so you could get more focused and so what you're bringing up is doing a two-way ANOVA, or sometimes called also an ANCOVA, right? Where you're taking different variables yeah. and applying them to your analysis, right? And what's frustrating, Ron, is as usual, you're a few steps ahead of me. And in our experimental design, we've actually got a demographic survey that we're going to apply when, remember I said Peter would give us his phone number? We're also going to say, Peter, give us this information about you. How long have you been in this industry? Are you brand new or you've been here a while, right? How long have you been with this company, right, that, you're, that you've just joined? A long time or brand new? Um, how old are you? What's your education level? What's your perceived um, capabilities with digital, right? Because we want to see how they react to virtual reality and the chatbot quizzes. Um, we want to see their motivation level. How motivated are you to take this? Are you just here because someone made you, or are you excited about taking this? Uh, race, gender, all sorts of stuff, so that we can break it down, slice and dice the analysis, and determine to what degree we can affect different, um, different <coughs> individuals within that sample population. So yes. Well, you, you only have so many, re I mean, the re you're resource limited. I mean, you're not going to have a thousand of these. and. So why waste resources on someone that all you've created is additional stress? Right. <laughs> the other issue, as you saw, was we went from almost 1,500 participants to less than, I think, 300 when it was on them to respond back to the survey. And so demographic survey, uh, we won't be able to make it. We'll, we'll have to make it optional to begin with. 
but I don't expect a lot of people to join in on that. So I'm really looking forward to a contracting organization wanting to differentiate themselves and make their folks go through this because then we have a really good uh, random sample population rather than just people who self-select for virtual reality. So yes, we are doing further studies into virtual reality. The emotional is one, self-efficacy is another, being able to find other variables, all of these are being done. Good question, Ron. Um, so this is a diffusion curve, right? And so this is what I was talking about with that diffusion of innovation. Right now, we're about here with virtual reality, barely getting started. And we're, we're starting to see some early adopters. And that's why we're looking into this, because we want to determine whether or not contracting organizations should even invest in this. Is it worthwhile? So far, the data shows, yeah, it's a little worthwhile. If you get 10% better re retention and long-term memory development with virtual reality than not, then why aren't you taking it? What's funny regarding this is for the last almost year, we've provided both the non-virtual reality training and the virtual reality training for the same price to all our contracting organizations. I think there's a five minute difference in terms of length, and yet we've had minimal people take it. We even have a pop-up that says, hey, Peter, you just, uh, you just said you'd take Firewatch. You know we got one virtual reality. They still don't take it. And so I am right in the grip of this diffusion of innovation problem where I'm wondering, all right, is this scurvy? Is this the keyboard? <laughs> or are we going to find some benefit here? And I, I think we will find some benefit rather soon. Do you find that, that certain, um, uh, let's take Hispanics in general, prefer to test uh, just the old school way and not the new way? Or does it, does it matter? So one, of the th one study we did, a little bit off the books, because we haven't published anything about it, there's this idea that there's this desire for innovation and for technology within training. And so what we did was we, we said, do you want to take this or not? And we graphed and tracked whether or not people said yes or no. Off the charts, no, from our user group. One of the things I was talking to Ron about was our audience that we train is not really um, studied very much in academic levels. Most articles we read don't, don't focus on our audience, our learner group. And so one of the things I'm trying to do is focus more on our learners, uh, people who are field laborers, field technicians. They don't get represented in a lot of these studies that we see. And so we're trying to do studies with them so we can determine, all right, what are they really looking for? And that's one of them, where they don't really want this technology. No, and I, I speak from a contractor's perspective, right, to where the younger generations that are coming in to the, to the business um, are a lot more willing to use technology. Digital Where natives, the yes. 45 to 55s, not so much. Right. You know, they don't want anything to do with it. And so trying to, to find that balance of how we get people involved with it um, is a huge undertaking. I love this stuff. Well, the other. Unless, unless they don't have to come to the safety council. Yeah. Then the 45 to 55 year olds think it's the best thing. Ever. Well, and so Ron's bringing up something. There's been a paradigm that's created where people are almost forced to come to the safety council for training. And so they almost discount it. Uh, let me just get out of here as quick as I can. And we're trying to change that dynamic and say, no, if you're going to come, we might as well get you something interesting and worthwhile. And that comes through variety, through better uh, engagement, through finding uh, one easy way, stop giving them the same thing every year. Change up the template, change up the pictures. It, I mean, it, yeah, it's an investment of our time and energy, but the investment from the learner will be so much greater. And so it's worth that energy to do. Uh, so yes, we do see that, that a lot of people are not uh, embracing this technology. There are different reasons for it. Good question, though. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to talk about was this. This is called the forgetting curve, the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. And the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve basically says uh, immediately upon it exiting the safety council or your class, you're going to begin forgetting. And there's, there's different uh, timelines and graphs that show it at different speeds. Uh, one of the things I think, one of the technologies or innovations that I think has an even greater appeal for our class, our, our audience, would be what's called retrieval practice. And retrieval practice is where you stop the forgetting curve from occurring by asking them questions. Let me give you a quick example. In our fire watch, we go over pass technique. And Peter, you know what pass is. Pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. Very good. 
And if you're brand new in the industry, that may be your first instant of hearing that, and you're going to start forgetting it. And so instead, we text Peter a week later, and we say, hey, Peter, what's pass again? And Peter has to sit there and think back and go, oh, yeah, I pull aim, squeeze something. And if he misses it, we retrain him, and we get it back up again. If he, if he gets it, we say, great job, Peter, and he remembers it on his own. And we do it again two weeks later. And if we do that for multiple things that we want Peter to remember, well, then you're keeping that training top of mind throughout. This, I think, has even greater potential than virtual reality, because then what you're doing is you're keeping training forefront in their mind at all times, rather than just, hey, you come to the council, you take training, then you leave. And you leave what you learned at the council. This would keep it there forever. And that's what that, we're looking that, for. That model um, can have great significance in that we've been killing people the same way in our industry for as long as we've been making oil products. Falls, struck by, caught in some mm -hmm. electrocutions. And if you would apply some basics of those focus four and then continue to send those little reminders out mm -hmm. on falls, struck by, caught in, electrocutions, um, then you know, you're keeping that, it top of mind. Keeping, yeah, keeping that on top of mind, and then over a period of time, that worker is going to say, "Okay, what's my what's my fall hazards? What's my struck by? What's and, and they're going to develop this this thought process of retrieval. And and the reality is, if we eliminate those four things, I mean, we're we're going to we're you're going to move the needle quite a bit. Yeah. The other thing you're not bringing up, and I'm glad you brought this up, is the and I don't have a graph for this. But the learning curve for new hires right now is much steeper than it was in the past because there's so many more technologies, so many more things that they have to confront. And I don't think we do as good a job as possible of using technology to help them overcome that learning curve. So I almost see a future where if you're a more experienced um, worker, you're not getting those reminders all the time. Or if you're brand new, maybe you're getting them every day until you get up to speed. Uh, right now, we're practicing this and we're studying this as well. We've done a study on microlearning to determine to what degree it's useful. Uh, we use it in a space practice environment. Uh, we, we tried it with several of our courses where if Willie's sitting through a course, he's allowed to practice during breaks and take quizzes. This helps overcome the testing effect and test anxiety where Willie is worried about the test. Well, get it over with during your microlearning practice. That are streamed while people are on break. And they can sit there and take a course and get credit for having taken that course just through uh, a chatbot quiz. And so always learning is what we're trying to do. You know, Dick, the idea of, uh, um, you know, I've witnessed the anxiety of these poor, a lot of times they're Hispanic workers, that English is their second language, and, you know, we're facing a great worker, worker shortage, and we put this, this test, you know, you pass the test, you get to play, you don't, and then it, it's just, it's mind-boggling to me that we can't break out of that cycle so isn't the idea that the guy learns through right. it and then, you know, where we have to eliminate this, well, you know what, um, everyone passes. Well, no, how about, how about it reframing it that everyone learns? Right. You know, versus you, there's know, a lot, you, can, you, can, you can play, you can't. There's a lot of uh, impact put on that test, right? And a lot of folks who we see come through our doors are not, aficionados at testing. <laughs> that may be why they came into our, our world, is they don't like tests. They don't like working with computers. And so we almost set them up for failure. And I think that there are better ways to, to help them succeed and get those jobs. I agree with you. Um, this was uh, images of the space practice during courses that we, we tried out. We even tried it with, uh, we tried it through a chatbot quiz to determine just how much people wanted to use it. Then we also tried it through Twitter and other and Insta, Instagram, and some others to see if they would use their own social media to take these quizzes more than if they just did it through a chat bot. And that was an interesting study. The answer is no, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> uh, the other thing I wanted to show you all quickly is we're trying some other things. Remember I said I hate when they, they, they come in, uh, when learners come into our council, they take training, then they leave the training at the council, they go back to work and they stop that connection that we've created with them. What we're trying to do is create uh, 
user communities, learning communities outside of just coming into the council. One, one type of that is this community within LinkedIn. All of the leadership training that we provide, all of those leaders are invited to this community where they can stay in touch with the facilitators and stay in touch with their classes. I think about alumni, right? Alumni organizations, that's something we should be promoting. This came about was during the flood about, what, seven years ago? Uh, the, uh, RV? Yes. Like 2017. Was it just that long? Oh, wow. Actually, okay, so right in between four and seven there. Anyway, uh, we got most of our neighborhood news from Facebook community rather than from uh, the television or radio. And I thought, well, why aren't we getting news out to our leaders that same way? Um, th remember I told you about the space practiced where we tried Twitter, we tried Instagram, and we saw that it just didn't have that much effect. What we find mostly is people do not want to be a part of this and if, if the company doesn't pay for their, their accounts. They, they leave work at work and they don't want to merge the two, even if it benefits them in terms of their career. Trying to find a way to break that is what we're looking into. And I think the best way to break that is to have multiple channels where you're in all of those places, <coughs> making it as easy as possible for the learner to find what makes the most sense for his style of interaction. So I don't know what the answer to that is yet. That's a massive undertaking because we're commoditizing craftsmen. Um, and so they're bouncing from one organization yep. to another just simply because pay is going up 25 cents an hour yep. or a dollar an hour. So having someone who refuses to buy into it, they want their employer. The employer can't really do it because the employee might leave for another. That's right. They don't want to invest in it until they're sure they're going to stay. It's, it's a challenge. The other thing we're doing with that community is we have a series of podcasts. I brought this up beforehand. Uh, as well as vlog casts, where you can see the video of the podcast that we've created. Very much, I think Joe Rogan stole our idea. Mm. And um, these are, what we're trying to do uh, is get uh, site owner representation so that our community of contractors can hear directly from the horse's mouth exactly what they want. And so that they can adapt, adjust, and, and, and get in front of them a little easier. Uh, and finally, uh, there we go, safety essentials. This is a brand new training that's just come out. Uh, it's computer-based training, but we're using a lot of techniques that I look forward to presenting to you all next year when I'm invited back that helps keep that engagement and helps keep the reinforcement level high. And so uh, again, if you wanna be invited to that webinar, there's a QR code. I was gonna go into a whole diffusion of innovation about QR codes, which have been around easily 10 years or more and are just now making a comeback with COVID, but I think that we're at a point where I should have just asked for questions. Does anyone have a question? Keep it up. Keep trying. Keep trying. What Go other ahead. Uh, virtual reality courses so, are you working with? So right now we have Confined Space and we have Firewatch, and those were self-funded just for these studies and so that we could determine if there was an appetite. We wanted to try one in scaffolding, but we're looking for a partner to work with on that one. Mm -hmm. um, I did hear from one site, an owner facility, they're having trouble with uh, dropped objects. Mm -hmm. And they have an international initiative for dropped objects and they're trying to separate themselves as a, as a unit. And they came to us to discuss doing a dropped objects virtual reality, which I think would be perfect in virtual reality when you talk, in a hands-on training on dropped objects, you're not gonna be able to drop an object on someone, <laughs> right? But in virtual reality, you can. And you can show to what degree the, a dropped object can affect a work crew uh, down the way. Another one that uh, we've been looking at with another contracting organization, line of fire, mm -hmm. staying out of the line of fire. So all of these are intriguing. We're, we've only worked on two. I look forward to the next. What have um, what the owner sites said about the virtual reality? Not very much. A lot of them have their own mm -hmm. uh, at corporate levels. Um, the biggest problem that we've heard from owner sites is distribution, right? Mm -hmm. They can't say to a contracting organization, hey, everyone needs to take confined space virtual reality because if, if, if you're limited in your delivery and distribution mm -hmm. and you mandate it across the board, well, then there's a huge subset that can't get access to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's primarily what we hear from a lot of them, yeah. Okay. But I do see a big investment from them, yeah. yeah. I know um, someone I was talking to at 
Excellent. Mm -hmm. Just a, a big virtual yep. reality thing that they're making. We talked to them as well. They were the ones who were like, how are you going to distribute? And we said, well, that's why we got all these machines, and we got <laughs> Texas City, and we got Port Lavaca, and we can have them all there. Yeah. So, yeah. They figure some remote area and say, how are you going to take care of that guy? So that actually, <laughs> that actually came up uh, when I worked with Peter. One of the things we were trying to develop was a Netflix-style virtual reality distribution, where you could pack a headset into a shoebox, ship it off when you want to go from tech one to tech two, or up to operator, you take the virtual reality as a test to finally get over that hump and get into operator level, ship it back to corporate, we upload the results, and then we ship it off to the next person. Uh, we never got there, but that's the goal. Yeah, go ahead. How, how about uh, going international? Because I'm, I'm about to, to open a branch. Yeah, I'll see you later. Great to see you. The company in, in Kenyana. Uh -huh. uh, Taking into consideration, you know, what's going on in Guyana right now, Suriname, you know, the, the Latin American Caribbean, actually. Yeah. And uh, is there any, any possibility to, to set up a joint venture with a local company there? That, I don't know, is that, the, uh, is that possible? Yeah, we were actually, I was in Guyana three or four years ago, okay. before COVID, a year before COVID. And we talked to them about establishing a safety council. Yeah, that's, that's There's one in Trinidad, Tobago that we help support as well. Yeah. So yes, there would definitely be opportunities for that. In terms of how it affects innovation, the, the biggest problem is the language barrier. And that's overcomable. We already do different languages now. Okay. Uh, so no, I, I, to answer your question, yes, very. make sure I get your card. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's good to hear that you're doing something in Guyana because that was four or five years ago. Well, you know, I'm, I'm originally from Venezuela. Uh huh. And, uh, but I'm now I'm living here. I'm US, I'm a new citizen. Uh huh. And uh, you know, I I would like to be part of what's going on there in that region. And, uh, it was it was wild. Um, one of my first trips, and it is uh, having grown up here. You, you know, all my life, we've had safety councils. And so it's a part of your life. You understand how it works in the systems, and you have this bedrock of training. And I went to Trinidad, Tobago, where it's very small still. And some people use it, some people don't. And then we went to Guyana, nothing. And you're like, wow, this is how it was in the 80s. And so uh, hopefully my, my boss is very interested in finding ways to expand the safety council systems outside of this area. Yeah. Are you based here in Texas? Yes. Or? No, in Houston. Houston. Okay. Yeah, uh, Pasadena. Okay. I'll give you that. And here, Peter. Gotcha. There you go. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Thank Great. you. And Willie, I think you have Wait, my rookie card. I do. <coughs>